Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to teach you about refeeding syndrome. By the end of the video, you should be able to define refeeding syndrome, explain the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome, and identify patients who are at risk of refeeding syndrome. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. In 2020, the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or ASPEN, offered the following definition for refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome is a measurable reduction of phosphorus, potassium, and or magnesium, or the manifestation of thiamine deficiency, that develops shortly after initiation of calorie provision to an individual who has been exposed to a substantial period of undernourishment. In other words, refeeding syndrome is a medical condition that is characterized by low electrolyte levels and or thiamine deficiency, and it occurs when there is a reintroduction of food to someone who has had persistently inadequate nutrient intake. The term food is used here in a general sense. Refeeding syndrome can occur with an oral diet, enteral nutrition, or parenteral nutrition. In practice, refeeding syndrome will usually look something like this. A patient presents to the hospital with an acute or chronic inability to meet their calorie needs. This could be for a number of reasons, but let's just say six weeks of abdominal pain and vomiting. Then, a nutrition intervention like parenteral nutrition occurs, and with hours or days, at least one electrolyte, or thiamine, decreases to a dangerously low level. If this is not identified quickly and treated, that level can continue to decrease, and there can be devastating consequences like respiratory failure, cardiac dysfunction, coma, or death. It is for this reason that risk of refeeding syndrome should be considered in the nutrition assessment of all hospitalized patients, and a specific protocol should be used to feed and monitor at-risk patients. In the second half of this lesson, we'll look closely at the assessment of risk. But first, I want to talk about the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome, or the process that leads to the development of the condition. This will tell us how and why it occurs. The exact mechanism behind refeeding syndrome is not entirely clear. However, there is agreement in the literature that it is related to a sudden shift from catabolic pathways, or breakdown pathways, to anabolic pathways, or build-up pathways. When total energy intake is low, blood glucose and insulin decrease to below normal levels. That decrease is met with an increase in glucagon, which stimulates the breakdown of glycogen in the liver. Once all of the glycogen is depleted, and the body is not receiving an adequate supply of new glucose, the body begins to break down body proteins to create it. If the inadequate intake persists, the body will ramp up the breakdown of fat for fuel, and there will be an increased production of ketones. During this process, the micronutrients that are normally found inside the cells are used up but not replaced. They can also be pushed out of the cells into the bloodstream. As a result, the cells become progressively deficient of them. At this point, the body is mostly catabolic. It is breaking down everything it can for survival, and the anabolic pathways, or building pathways, are almost completely shut down. The body is also holding on to the few nutrients it does have through compensatory measures like decreased excretion of micronutrients from the kidneys. Once the nutritionally depleted patient is fed, the influx of glucose is met with an increase in insulin. An increase in insulin leads to glucose being taken into the cells and the stimulation of anabolic pathways like glycogen, fat, and protein synthesis. 
since phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and thiamine support these processes, they are also taken into the cells and used up. As the fed state continues, the use of micronutrients outpaces how quickly they are being replaced. This results in a severe deficiency both inside and outside the cells. Severe deficiency results in failure of the nervous and muscular systems, and therefore failure of the body's vital organs. Through this illustration, we can see that patients with prolonged inadequate energy intake are at risk for refeeding syndrome. Other risk factors that can be found through a nutrition assessment are low BMI, recent unintentional weight loss, and evidence of subcutaneous fat loss or muscle depletion. Also included are low pre-feeding blood levels of potassium, phosphorus, or magnesium, and diseases or conditions that are associated with an increased risk of refeeding syndrome. Some examples are anorexia nervosa, alcohol use disorder, food insecurity, and states of malabsorption like short bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease. Aspen has gone ahead and developed specific criteria for identifying patients who are at moderate risk and those who are at significant risk. Due to a limited amount of research on refeeding syndrome, Aspen makes it clear that these are general guidelines based on consensus from a group of experts. According to Aspen, for a patient to be at moderate risk of refeeding syndrome, they must meet at least two of the following criteria. For BMI, it is between 16 and 18.5 kilograms per meter squared. For unintentional weight loss, it is 5% in one month. For recent intake, it is minimal to no oral intake for 5 to 6 days, or an intake of less than 75% of estimated calorie need for greater than one month. For electrolytes, it is slightly low levels of potassium, phosphorus, or magnesium, or recent low levels would need for minimal supplementation to correct. Fat or muscle loss would be mild to moderate, and there could be a disease associated with refeeding syndrome that is of moderate severity. For a patient to be at significant risk of refeeding syndrome, the categories are the same, but the parameters are different, and the patient must only meet one of the criteria. For BMI, it is less than 16 kilograms per meter squared. For unintentional weight loss, it is 7.5% in the past three months, or greater than 10% in the past six months. For recent intake, it is minimal to no intake for greater than seven days, or an intake of less than 50% of estimated calorie need for greater than one month. For electrolytes, it is moderately or significantly low levels of potassium, phosphorus, or magnesium, or recent low levels would need for significant supplementation to correct. Fat or muscle loss would be severe, and there could be a disease associated with refeeding syndrome that is also severe. My interpretation of this criteria is that any patient who meets the criteria for severe malnutrition using the AND Aspen criteria is also at significant risk of refeeding syndrome. Since more patients will meet the criteria for malnutrition than will actually go on to develop refeeding syndrome, Predicting who is most likely to develop it can be a challenge. One aspect to consider is that risk is likely cumulative. So, even though a patient only needs to meet one criteria to be considered at significant risk, a patient who meets three or four of the criteria likely has higher risk than a patient who only meets one. If you are just beginning your journey into patient care, any case where a patient meets the criteria for significant risk of refeeding syndrome should be taken very seriously. A few years of experience will bring a better understanding of who is the most likely to develop it and who technically meets the criteria 
but is actually unlikely to develop it. Before we finish up, there are two other aspects of assessment that I want to mention. The first has to do with assessment of electrolyte levels. The second has to do with assessment of thiamine status. When we looked at the pathophysiology for refeeding syndrome, I said the body will hold on to nutrients by decreasing excretion from the kidneys. This may be relevant when assessing electrolyte status because phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium are all nutrients the body will try to retain. As a result, it is not uncommon for someone with poor body stores of phosphorus, potassium, and or magnesium to present with normal levels in the blood. So, while a low blood level of any of these nutrients counts as a risk factor, do not assume that a normal level means that the patient's micronutrient status is good. If the body is primed for refeeding syndrome, cells will be eager to soak up whatever is available. The other aspect I want you to consider is the assessment of thiamine status. If you recall, thiamine deficiency appeared in Aspen's definition of refeeding syndrome. It also appeared in my description of the pathophysiology. Nevertheless, it did not appear in the criteria for identifying patients who are at risk. Only the electrolytes did. This is not due to a lack of importance. Thiamine is a vitamin that is rapidly depleted with inadequate intake, and deficiency can lead to severe neurological abnormalities and cardiac dysfunction. The reason it is not a criteria is because laboratory testing for thiamine is currently unreliable. More research needs to go into determining the best testing method and reference range before it is suggested for routine measurement. Clinicians who seek out a laboratory measurement for thiamine may also find that their medical institution does not have the ability to test for it. The blood will then have to be sent to an outside testing facility, which can take several days to get a result. For a condition like refeeding syndrome, several days is simply too long to wait. Thankfully, thiamine has a low risk profile. So, if there is concern that a patient has poor thiamine status, it can be supplemented intravenously with little concern for toxicity. That's it for the pathophysiology and assessment of risk for refeeding syndrome. In the next video, I'm going to dive into both prevention and treatment. Here is a summary for this lesson. Refeeding syndrome is a medical condition that is characterized by low electrolyte levels and or thiamine deficiency. It occurs when there is a reintroduction of food to someone with persistently inadequate intake. The term food is used here in the general sense since it can also occur with enteral or parenteral nutrition. Refeeding syndrome is a major concern because it can lead to dysfunction of multiple organs and in severe cases it can lead to organ failure and death. It is for this reason that risk of refeeding syndrome should be considered in the nutrition assessment of all hospitalized patients. The pathophysiology, or process that leads to the development of refeeding syndrome, is not entirely clear. However, there is agreement in the literature that it is connected to a rapid switch from catabolic to anabolic pathways. When energy intake is low, the body is mostly catabolic, breaking down glycogen, body proteins, and fat to create what it needs to survive. During this process, electrolytes and thiamine are used up and not replaced, leading to deficiency in the cells. Once the patient is fed, energy finally becomes available. The glucose leads to an increase in insulin, Insulin stimulates anabolic pathways. Anabolic pathways use up micronutrients faster than they can be replaced. And micronutrients reach a level of severe deficiency. That deficiency is what causes all of the problems. 
the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition has released guidelines for assessing risk of refeeding syndrome. They classify risk as moderate or significant using criteria such as BMI, recent weight loss, recent intake, electrolyte status, fat and muscle status, and disease state. Patients at significant risk only need to meet one of the criteria, such as having a BMI less than 16 or having minimal to no intake for greater than 7 days. An important consideration when using this tool from Aspen is that risk is likely cumulative, meaning the more criteria that are met, the greater the risk. It is also important to consider that electrolytes can appear to be at normal levels even when electrolyte status is poor, and that laboratory testing of thiamine status does not appear in the criteria because it is currently unreliable. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.